medical doctors graduated on WhatsApp University. Absolutely, absolutely. But they'll be all diploma holders. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, doctors. Uh, so we will be uh, going live in another uh, one minute. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Tell us when we are, we are online. Another one minute. You happened to be in India in February. Uh, we met in Hyderabad, right? Yes, I was in Hyderabad. And then I went back through London. I was afraid because England had already some cases, but I, I, I didn't get COVID yet. I tested. I, I'm negative yet. Oh, good. <coughs> So, Dr. Joa, are you going for OPD? Are you seeing patients? Yes, yes. Uh, that's uh, I'm going to show in the presentation some uh, what we are doing now and in, in the group of international uh, endoscopic surgery and uh, what what should be the future. But yes, uh, emergency cases, uh, not uh, elective cases. Elective cases we have stopped everything, and uh, in the office, the, the, the seeing patients had reduced up to 75 percent. So we are not seeing a lot of patients and we are not doing a lot of surgeries at this time. So in fact, uh, following your uh, webinar, we have a, I have a webinar on how to practice uh, in the COVID era. And so I will uh, unfortunately miss the last 10 hello. minutes of your presentation because I need to join. Hello, sir. Uh, hello? Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah, sir, uh, we are live now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Samir Vargo to introduce our international faculty, Dr. Jiva. Good evening, everybody. In this COVID era where we all know that how the uh, COVID has, has embraced the entire world with its uh, tentacles, but we have many other diseases, many other chronic ailments uh, which deserve our focus and attention and uh, how to deal with the other patients in this COVID era. Uh, today, uh, AOI Mumbai branch has put together this uh, webinar and it's gonna be a very interesting one on endoscopic surgeries post COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, uh, today to enlighten us on this topic, we have uh, none other than Dr. Joa Nogueira, uh, most of us don't need, uh, Joa doesn't need an introduction to all of us. He's been here a number of times in the last few years. We've had the good fortune of hosting him at uh, Mumbai, at Cooper Hospital for the Mumbai Con and then the endoscopic uh, ear surgery workshop in 2018. Uh, he was here in uh, February as well this year to, to India and uh, so, uh, but today he is going to be talking to us on uh, not endoscopic ear surgery, but another topic. So, Dr. Joa, as we all know, is one of the uh, premier proponents of endoscopic ear surgery. He has produced uh, silver books on endoscopic ear anatomy, 2010, endoscopic management of uh, cholestatoma. But he has an equal interest in endoscopic uh, uh, base skull and endoscopic sinus surgery as well. He has 29 publications uh, on various endoscopic sinus, skull base, and ear procedures. He is very well known for his 3D surgical techniques in sinus and ear surgeries. And I'm sure almost all of us have read his chapter and his book on endoscopic ear surgery, which came out in 2013 uh, in the Otolaryngology Clinics of uh, North America. So Dr. Joa, uh, who resides in Sierra, Brazil, he's the uh, assistant professor in the department uh, over there, will be sharing his uh, experiences and how he plans to tackle uh, uh, this uh, COVID scenario. So welcome, uh, Dr. Joa, and uh, good morning to you. It's early in the morning in uh, Brazil, and he has been kind enough to, uh, to uh, come down to present this uh, via the webinar. Welcome, Joa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Dr. Samir is a good friend from Mumbai as, as the others, Yogesh and Raman. And, and uh, I, I like to say India is my second country because uh, uh, it's, it's 
kind of br like Brazil. People, it's, it's so warm and so so humble. So I, I like it very much. I'm sorry I cannot be there on those pandemic days, but I was there in February, as Dr. Samit told, in Hyderabad, and was a very nice experience as always. So I'm going to start to 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 try to share my screen here. And then I'm going to open the, the presentation. <coughs> I am with this cough, but it's not COVID. Eh? It's a kind of allergic, just for the audience. So uh, today I'm not going to talk uh, specifically on endoscopic ear surgery. I, I, like, I would like to talk about uh, what we are doing here now, the experience of Brazil now, and uh, how do we manage the surgeries, the emergencies, and some views for the future. And Dr. Samir is going to talk uh, later about uh, how to uh, attend patients with uh, COVID. It's going to be very nice, this experience today. And it's good because it's India and Brazil, which are countries uh, that are similar, not in size, of course. India has more people than Brazil. But in reality, because uh, here now we are under a kind of a lockdown. It's not complete lockdown, but uh, social restrictive measures. And as you know, Brazil is a poor country. We have a lot of social problems. And of course, we from the middle class and the rich, we can do, uh, uh, we can stay home and uh, we will not uh, worry about the salary for, for some months, whatever. But the poor people in Brazil, sometimes they live on small houses, on favelas. A lot of people inside the same house, 10, 20 people on very small houses, old people, young people, uh, adults, and those, uh, those uh, humans, they don't have uh, any, any, any bank account or they don't have any, any way to survive, so they have to work every day. So they are going out to the streets and, and the virus is disseminated here in Brazil. So in the, in Brazil, I think we have th these uh, problems because to do a lockdown in New York is one thing, in Italy is one uh, another thing. But to do a lockdown here in Brazil or in India is completely different. So we are going to talk about the management of those surgeries. This is a picture of my friend Daniele Marchioni from Verona in the northern part of Italy, which was one of the uh, most hated cities with uh, the COVID. And in Italy, and we could learn about uh, a lot with Italy, the Italian experience, because <coughs> when they had the cases, it was already uh, already a Community-based transmission was not uh, over uh, a guy who, who fled uh, from China or from Iran. In Italy, they discovered the disease already when the disease was already very, very disseminated uh, throughout the community. So this picture is from him, it's, and it's a sign that we as humans, we will win. Uh, I'm not sure that over, uh, over the next uh, months or the next years, we will win against this virus, and then uh, it will have a very good experience for all of us, and may we change the way we live or we, the way we see life and the way we see the things. So uh, this is a, <coughs> a QR code. If you take a picture of this QR code, you, you're going to be redirected to the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, and then all the videos, including the historical ones. Uh, can be found on, on this uh, YouTube channel. So uh, if you can take a picture, it's good. As Dr. Samir uh, told, I'm from Fortaleza. Fortaleza is here in the tip of South America. And uh, uh, we have a saying here that God is Brazilian. And uh, if God is Brazilian, we say that uh, he put Brazil in the South America continent because we are in the last uh, continent, the last position where the COVID hit. So we had time to prepare ourselves, learning from the experience from, from Europe, uh, from Asia, uh, from America, from North America, and then. Uh, and uh, we had this before, in 1918, 1919, you know I like history, we had the Spanish flu, which was not Spanish, it was American. It was the, the origin of the virus was in Kansas and was transmitted more uh, during the First World War. So. Uh, the Spanish flu came in Brazil uh, through the ports, the seaports. 
So three or four major cities in Brazil were the main entrants of the Spanish flu. Recife, Salvador, Rio de Janeiro, and Santos. These were the four main hubs, main ports, seaports in Brazil, and then the, the, the disease uh, spread. And we can find some similar similarities between the Spanish flu and the COVID-19, the use of masks, uh, the use of hydroxychloroquine, because one of the, the things that we, we recommended at the time was the use of quinine uh, to try to, to, which is one, one distant uh, parent from hydroxychloroquine, to try to treat the, the patients. And um, we had the curves. We had the same discussion about flattering the, the curve. And this is Rio, which was the capital of Brazil at the time. And the picture down is Fortaleza, which is the city that I live on. We were also hit by the 1918-1919 Spanish flu. And uh, we had the same discussions. If you look at the newspapers at the time, the same discussions that we are having now about the economy, about lockdowns, about uh, uh, going back to work, about treatments, uh, the same discussions we had in 1918 and 1919. And it, it's very nice to, to know that because as, as, you, as I tell you all the time, history tends to repeat itself. And the problem is sometimes we don't understand that and we tend to repeat the same mistakes all over again. So it's very important to understand this is papers from 1918 and 1919. <coughs> and this is the hospital that I, that I work. It's called Hospital São Carlos, which is one of the hospitals here in Fortaleza, which received the first cases of COVID. COVID-19 here in Brazil, it came, since the, the, the Spanish flu came from the seaports, COVID-19 came through the airports. So the four main international hubs in Brazil are located in the four cities which we have the most number of cases. First one is Sao Paulo, which has the most number of cases. Second one is Rio de Janeiro. Third one is Brasilia, which is the current capital of Brazil. And fourth one is Fortaleza, the city that I live. So we have a lot of direct flights from here to America and from here to Europe. We don't have flights uh, to Asia from here, only from Sao Paulo. But um, uh, uh, we, 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 we got a lot of patients from Europe. And those patients, probably they brought the virus with, uh, with them. And then uh, the virus came uh, first in the rich, uh, in the class A so, uh, type of society, which is the people that uh, travel and, and go outside, go to Europe. Blah, blah. So uh, these people, in Brazil, we have two health systems. We have a public system, which is universal, and then we have the private system. The public system is, is good, it's not so bad. We have a universal vaccination, but the problem is the limitations of the public service itself. Uh, limitations in, in hospitals, in number of beds, number of ICUs and, and, and materials. The private system is good. The private system, you have a lot of hospitals, you have a lot of beds, good hospitals, good equipment, everything. So here in Ceará, we have about 9 million people in the whole state of Ceará. Brazil, we have 220 million people. In the state of Ceará, we have about 9 million people. 3 million people about live in the area of Fortaleza, which is the city that I live. Out of those 9 million people, about 8 million, they rely 100% on the public service. They don't have any private insurance. So if they get sick, they have to go to a public hospital. Uh, about 1 million rely on the private uh, sector, on the private system. So for this 1 million, we have the same amount of beds of the other 8 million people. So for this 1 million people which got sick first, not 1 million people got sick, but from this people that came from, from overseas, these rich people that has insurance companies, uh, we have beds. We always had beds. That, that, that's no problem. The problem is from the other 8 million people. And that's why we, the state and the, the government decided to have social restrictive measures to close the commerce, to close the shops, close some industries, to have time to prepare the system, the public system, to have more beds. So we added more than 600 beds into the public system. A lot of ICU beds included uh, because the, 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 the state uh, rented 
hospitals, built uh, 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 war hospitals in, in the stadiums that we use here at the World Cup. So uh, the, the preparations were very important, uh, especially in the last month and this month. And then next month, we, we tend to have uh, more cases as maybe we progress to less restrictive uh, uh, measures. Uh, to open some some parts of commerce, to open some parts of the economy. <clears throat> so one of the most important things that happened in 1918 was the universal use of masks. And I'm not telling about the PPF, PFF2 or PFF3 masks or surgical masks, but I'm telling about uh, uh, tissue masks, normal masks that you can uh, do it in home. So uh, here in Brazil, we started, or oh, many people started this campaign, Mask for, for All, so that everyone should wear a mask, uh, especially when they go out on the streets to the supermarket, to, to the hospitals, because uh, it doesn't uh, completely um, avoid the contamination between persons, but it, 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 it reduces the, the risk of contamination with the COVID, because the COVID is very, very, very different. <coughs> but one important thing also, we have to wear masks in our mouths and our nose, but also sometimes we have to wear masks in our ears because um, in this pandemic, we have a lot of information, which is good because if you have information, it's good. But sometimes you cannot deal with this information. And there is a lot of misinformation also, especially on WhatsApp groups or social media. And then we have to have masks on also our eyes and our ears to try to protect ourselves from, from those uh, messages. And also we have to explain to the patients or explain to our uh, parents that uh, some information is real, true, and some information is not real. So I always like to say that nowadays we have a, a lot of specialists on empiric knowledge at the WhatsApp University. So we have to take uh, uh, care with the, the WhatsApp University. So this is a paper that we, we published as, a, as a, a guideline for surgeries, ear surgeries, especially on those pandemic uh, days. So this video, I think you already saw, is a video uh, uh, that shows how is the contamination of the COVID-19. Uh, and I'm not going to explain here the, the physiopathology of the COVID-19 because I'm sure every one of you know so it's very important to understand that. But the virus is a very tricky virus. It's not very uh, difficult to inactivate the virus because virus is a protein uh, and, 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 and grass and lipids and with an RNA or DNA inside. So many, many products can kill the viruses. Um, alcohol, um, sanitary water, uh, uh, oxygen water, peroxide oxygen water, a lot of products, simple products, can kill, uh, kill, uh, kill like this because a virus you cannot kill. It's not a, a living thing, so you can inactivate or destroy uh, the virus. <coughs> but this virus is very tricky because it can live in in some surfaces for many many days sometimes. And in the OR, in the hospital, and in the office, you have a lot of, of surfaces that uh, the virus can can uh, survive. So, for instance, we have a lot of plastic in the ORs or in the office. We have a lot of steel on the OR. We have glass on the OR. We have paper. We work with paper. So we have to take care about this, uh, 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 these uh, surfaces, these materials, because we can have problems uh, in, this, uh, in the virus uh, with this. So to protect is the most important message that I can pass to you today. If you don't remember anything about what I said on, those, on this lecture, but if you remember that I said to protect yourself, this is the most important thing. We are soldiers. You cannot, as a soldier, go to war without protective uh, uh, gear. We are firefighters. You cannot uh, uh, fight a, fi a fire uh, naked. You have to have uh, protective materials. And these protective materials are very important. Face shield, masks. Two masks we use on the OR, the PFF2 and a surgical mask. Gowns uh, that are waterproof, gloves, two gloves, goggles, 
everything is important to protect yourself. Otherwise, you, go, you can be contaminated and then you can disseminate this virus throughout your family, throughout your... And also you can have problems. It's not that this virus only will kill uh, people over 60 or over 70 years old. I have a lot of friends, doctors, young doctors as myself, that are dead now because of the virus. So it's very important. And one of the most uh, hit professionals with the virus is the ENT. Because ENT had an exception in ophthalmologists. We work, uh, we examine this area. And there, the virus uh, likes the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the throat. So it's very important to understand this and to try to, to do this. Another thing, we here, up to one month, we suspended all elective procedures. All. This is very important. And when I talk to Daniele Marchioni in Italy and Prof. Presuti and Jose Carlos Casquero in Madrid, in Spain, they always said the same thing. Stop all elective surgery. Stop. Why? Because, first of all, you can in endanger your patient because uh, there are some papers that show that even patients asymptomatic uh, when go to elective surgery, they can have mortality rates up to 20%, which is bad. And also, you can uh, contaminate yourself and contaminate uh, the anesthesi anesthesiologist, contaminate the hospital, contaminate many, many people doing surgeries that otherwise you should not do at this time, at this point in time. <coughs> so this is very, very important to stop all uh, elective surgeries at this time. This video is... Ah, this video is a video from my friend, Rafael Ortega, that shows from the Boston, that shows uh, when you intubate the patient, it's very, very tricky because sometimes you can have a lot of, 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 of aerosols and this virus can survive on aerosols and then you can have contamination um, in, the whole, in, the whole, uh, in the whole OR, in the whole office. So imagine if you don't protect yourself with masks, with the, the, the face shield, with uh, neck protection, with gloves, you can have contamination of aerosols uh, in a lot of, pla a lot of uh, places in the OR and also in yourself. So this is very, very important to try to understand. And what about uh, ear? Because I told the virus likes the nose, likes the throat. What, what about the ear? Uh, there's no paper on it yet, but uh, theoretically, the bone does not carry a lot of viruses in the bone. So in the mastoid, probably in the bone, we don't have a lot of virus. But the problem is when you do a mastoidectomy, for instance, you have to drill, and then sometimes you drill the mucosa. And probably, and I say probably because we don't have a paper on that also, we will have virus on the mucosa of the mastoid, on the mucosa of the middle ear, and at the eustachian tube. Because um, it's the same uh, respiratory mucosa that we have on the nose. The, 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 the chance of this happens is small, but it can. So any procedure that generates aerosol over the intubation, but the aerosol, it's, it's, it should be avoided on those days. Uh, because it's very, very important to say. And then I saw a paper from, from England, the, the British uh, ENT Academy recommendations, the Royal British Academy recommendations, and one of the recommendations was to do the ear surgery if you need to do an emergency like otomastoiditis with the old instruments that we used to do uh, in the past, in the real past, which is uh, chisels and hammers and all the, the old stuff. And then, as you know, I like history very much, and I have a lot of, of historical movies with people doing mastoidectomy with uh, curettes, with uh, chisels and hammers, and uh, we, we came back to those years, to those times again uh, with this pandemic to do the surgeries with uh, this kind of, of material, no, no birds uh, and uh, different types of instruments that uh, we thought we would never uh, use them again. Huh? So it's very, very interesting to say and to see that history uh, repeats itself uh, when we talk about this. So we have a lot of videos showing the mastoidectomy with uh, the gown here, the hammer, and then to open the mastoid and to use those instruments and 
instruments that I have never used uh, before. I've just seen the movies, but uh, uh, I used on those days to do a small mastoidectomy in a patient with otomastoiditis. <clears throat> but as I told, we have to protect ourselves, protect everything. So this is the face shield that I use, the headlight, sometimes I use goggles, uh, two masks, the gowns here. The, the... And one important thing, one very nice thing, it's very difficult when you do this, when you protect yourself, to, to perform microscopic ear surgery. Why? Because if you have a face shield, you cannot put your eyes on the microscopic eyepiece. And you have to have face shield, because if you don't, you saw that there will be a lot of aerosols that can be on your face, and then you can contaminate yourself, even with the goggles. Because the problem sometimes is not during the procedure, but rather when you are unmounting yourself, when you are undressing, removing all this protective gear, and sometimes you can contaminate your hands, and then you, you put on your eyes or your mouth or your nose, and then you can contaminate yourself. So you have to have protection. This is the most important thing. Protect yourself and not like this. Not to put like an x-ray as a face shield. You have to have proper protection. Protection is not, it's like going to war. You cannot go to war with a helmet that does not, uh, it's not bulletproof. This is not going to work. So you have to protect yourself. This is the most important thing. One important thing is testing. I don't know the situation in India, but the situation in Brazil is not good about testing. We don't have enough, enough tests to test everyone. The, the protocols, they say that uh, you should test the patients uh, 48 hours, 24 hours, and in the day of the procedure, to do the procedure. Uh, here, we don't, we don't do this because we don't have enough tests. And even the tests, the credibility of the tests is not so good. This, the specificity and the sensibility of the tests are not so good as you can uh, as you can say as you can see on this uh, slide. So what we do, we treat each and every patient as a COVID positive patient. So every patient is like if the patient has a lot of viruses. So you have to protect yourself, protect every everyone at the OR because this is a very important. So when you go inside the OR, when you enter this OR, which is uh, designed for COVID patients, for instance. Uh, if you have a negative pressure, it's better. Uh, if you don't, you have to protect more yourself. One important thing, don't, don't remove the mask. So when you are inside the room, you keep the mask. Why? Because the virus can be in the aerosol for many, many hours. So if you remove, sometimes I see surgeons, uh, that uh, end the surgery and then remove the mask. Or do the, the surgery with the mask just in the mouth, not in the nose. So when you enter the surgery, even if the patient is not, uh, uh, is not yet on the room, you have to wear the mask. And then the patient comes, the anesthesiology will anesthetize the patient, you use the mask during the surgery, and you never remove the mask. And the same thing happens with the anesthesiology and also with the a scrub nurse, and also with the, the paramedical staff that stay in the office, in the OR. This is very important. Another thing, very important for us, <coughs> to do procedures with those kinds of material is difficult. It's not easy. I consider myself a kind of, I have some experience on endoscopic procedures. And the first time that I was doing a surgery was a, a cauterization of sphenopalatine artery with the endoscope. It was, was not good, was, was not easy, because this face shield thing, it, it blurs the, your vision. Uh, the use of the goggles also blurs your vision. And then you have like an image which is not, it's, it's, it's unfocused. It's different, the image. Even with a good camera, I was using a Meiji One HD, which is a good camera, but a good endoscope, but I could not see very well. So this is very important. Uh, these are times, these pandemic times, are times where the residents will not operate or will operate very, very seldom because the, all the surgeries, especially the emergency surgeries, which are the surgeries that are, are being performed at this time, should be performed by the most experienced senior surgeons that you have on your service because it's difficult and you can have more time and more time with the surgery is more time with the possibility of contamination of everyone in the OR. 
So uh, residents at this time here in Brazil, in some services, they are more uh, doing, um, I would say, bureaucratic uh, works or paperwork and are not going into the surgeries. And also to protect them because as, may, as, as more people you have on the OR, more people can be contaminated. And if you contaminate more people, it's, more people, it's less doctors to attend the patients. So during the OR, we keep only the essential staff at the OR. So probably no assistance. Every su surgery that I perform with no assistant at this time, just one scrub nurse, one anesthesiologist, and one uh, nurse to be circulated into, into the room to, to bring drugs, to bring equipment, to bring things that we need. So less people in the OR is recommended at this time and surgeries should be performed by the most experienced surgeons at this time. So, um, and as you know, I like very much Star Wars and I was feeling like Darth Vader using those guns and stuff like that. So these are some, some, some masks that you can use. The surgical mask does not protect you 100% uh, against the COVID virus. Surgical mask is good for, for going to the streets, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> the only masks that are going to protect yourself is uh, sometimes the N95, which is the same thing of the F FP2 and the FP FFP3. So uh, these are the P100. These masks from the N95 uh, above are going to protect uh, yourself. Of course, the N95 doesn't protect 100%. And also the FFP2. Uh, protects about 95% of the times. Uh, that's why it's N95. That's why on, on the OR, you should wear N95 or F, FP2 and also a surgical mask over the N95. <coughs> you should not put your surgical mask uh, before the N95 because if you put the surgical mask before and then the N95 of the FFP2 or P3 after, there will be uh, spots that you can have uh, entrance of air and then you can have contamination. Also, uh, there's no paper on that, but to have a beard or a mustache at this time is, is worse when uh, to use those masks because also the beard can have this problem of uh, this limitation uh, uh, of, 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 of escape of air uh, to go inside. So uh, this is very important to understand. So I was feeling like, uh, Darth Vader, <coughs> and Darth Vader was a visionary, as you can see, because he wore uh, gloves, very good gloves. He wore protective uh, a cape, protective gowns, waterproof ones. He wore a face shield, and also his face shield has already had already a ventilator inside the face shield. So he, he knew what he was doing, and he was prepared for COVID-19 uh, wars, I said like this. So... This is <coughs> very important. So to intubate the patient, you have a lot of, of, of problems uh, related. It should be a, a fast sequence intubation. Uh, the system should be closed most of the times. Um, you should close the tube uh, before connecting the tube to the system. And so it's very, very important to do uh, this intubation with a very good anesthesiologist, a very experienced anesthesiologist, also because this is the time where many people can be contaminated uh, if the patient has COVID. And as I, I told you before, we are doing surgeries uh, in every patient if the patient has a COVID because we don't test uh, most of the patients. So also he, she looks like, she is my wife, as you know, she looks uh, like a stormtrooper uh, during this COVID times. <coughs> so, to use a microscope is difficult because we need to put our eyes into the uh, eyepiece of the of the microscope. And nowadays, with face shield, it's difficult. It's different. This this is a a, a, sur a surgery that I did before the pandemic, so it's difficult to have uh, uh, the the use of the microscope. But you can use the endoscope, and and sometimes for most emergencies uh, like automastoiditis. The bone is, uh, in children, for instance, is very, very thin. So you only use like a curette or, or a chisel and a hammer, and then you enter the mastoid, and then you drain the pus, and, and then you can have uh, this kind of, of procedure. But my friend from the Children's Hospital uh, in North Carolina, uh, he developed a way to do surgeries uh, without the, the face shield. Uh, and, uh, 
and uh, oops, I'll just remove here the audio. <coughs> this video is is uh, on my YouTube channel also, and he is not using the face shield as you know. He is using two masks here, two gloves, one protective gown and goggles, and then he creates a small, um, I would say, tent uh, at the surgical field um, with uh, plastic to create a surgical field uh, that can be protected to protect the other, other surgeons in the room and also to, to use the microscope. So doing like this, he can use the microscope without the face shield, but having the stent to protect the field against the aerosols or against many, many aerosols. This, not, uh, this does not rely 100% of protection, but it's an alternative if you, if you must use the microscope during the procedure. If you, if, you, if, you sh if you cannot use the microscope or if you don't need to use the microscope, use the endoscope or use only the eyes because it's better. But if you do need to use the microscope, you can protect the microscope using this kind of tent uh, at the surgical uh, field, okay? <coughs> but you have emergencies. Sometimes you have uh, emergencies like this, uh, like uh, worms like this in the ear, and then you have to remove. So in this, uh, we use the endoscope to, to remove those worms uh, inside the ear of, of the patient. So this is uh, good to do with endoscopic ESH. So we created this kind of priorities, a priority scale based on many scales uh, from the British uh, Royal Society, from the American Society, from the Brazilian Society, uh, scales of priorities to do the service. So we have four types of priorities here, priority one, two, three, and four. And according to the priority, of course, it's uh, patient-based. You, you should uh, uh, evaluate every patient and try to decide the priority uh, uh, with the patient uh, when, and with the case of the patient. But this is roughly uh, 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 a more, I would say, a general priority scale in order for you to try to understand the needs of surgery at this time. So priority level one is surgery should be done within 72 hours or three days. So people with uh, chronic ear disease with intracranial complications, uh, button battery in external auditory canal because uh, this can release some chemical products, products that can be bad for the hearing or for, to, for trauma better. Temporal bone trauma <coughs> with a vascular injury Acute mastoiditis, not responding to medical therapy, even IV medical therapy. Uh, traumatic facial nerve injury. Uh, facial pulse is secondary to chronic ear disease. External ear trauma with hematoma laceration, especially those ear of, of fighters that you, can, you need to drain the, the, the blood, uh, otherwise the, the ear will be uh, deformed. Uh, perichondritis with abscess formation. Uh, active perilymphatic fistula with a recent history of meningitis and other severe complications of mid ear disease that are not responding to medical therapy, even uh, IV medical therapy. And also for those who practice skull based procedures, cerebral pontine tumors, angle tumors with life threatening brain stem uh, compression. So this is roughly the, the emergencies or the urgencies that we are dealing right now. So when we have a patient with this, we should operate. <coughs> the priority level two is uh, surgery could be safely deferred up to four weeks, so one month. We can delay the surgery to one month with no uh, main product uh, problems to the patient. So post um, meningitic uh, cochlear implantation, uh, you cannot wait a lot. But uh, even one month, you can wait, uh, wait until the cochlea does not calcify itself and you cannot put an implant. Temporal bone malignancy, if you um, talk to the oncologist, if you talk to the patient, and if you can wait sometimes, uh, it's, it's good to wait a little bit, but sometimes you cannot, so you have to do uh, the surgery. Uh, Barotraumatic perilymphatic fistula, sometimes you can wait also up to one month. Organic foreign bodies in the ear, which are not complicated, not products with product with uh, chemical products. So you can wait until four weeks. 
and infected auditory implant, which is not uh, responding to medical therapy. Sometimes you have to do the surgery. Sometimes you can wait a little bit the surgery. So it's roughly the guideline, but you can uh, decide to do the surgery in a less period of time if the patient is uh, worsening its clinical condition. And if you talk to the patient, if you decide as doctor and patient to do the surgery before. Priority level three is the surgery that can be delayed up to three months with no predictive negative outcome. So cochlear implantation in prelegal, profound sensorial hearing loss, uh, in children especially, of course, the delay can, can create a problem, but not a big problem. The, the children will hear and will have a capacity to, with the cerebral spasticity, spasticity, to learn the language with no main big problems if you delay the surgery up to three months. If you do the surgery now, you can put the children at risk, uh, and it's not uh, good. So symptomatic inner erosion with fistula associated with cholesteatoma, low flow cerebral fluid leak, uh, in the absence of meningitis, of infections. So these surgeries roughly can be delayed up to three months. And priority level four, there are surgeries that can be delayed for more than three months with no problems to the patient. So cholesteatoma with no intracranial complications or not uh, 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 imminent complications, uh, chronic supratidiotitis media with no complications, ossicular chain reconstruction, middle implant, stape surgery, tympanoplasty, meringoplasty, um, meatoplasty, vestibular surgery, uh, pediatric otitis media with effusion to put the ear tubes, uh, station tube balloon uh, dilation, uh, acoustic neuromas with no life-threatening brainstem compression, third wind syndrome. These surgeries can be delayed. You should not do the surgeries elective surgeries at this time because it can be worse for you, for your staff, your hospital, and also the patient itself. So it's very important to understand this. So we are doing some surgeries, but uh, only surgeries with, uh, with um, for instance, complications of brain complications or brain invasions like uh, this one. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, erosion of the uh, of the bone here and intracranial complication. The patient already had meningitis. So in this uh, procedure, uh, we use the endoscope, of course, and then uh, we uh, use uh, like a chisel and a hammer to do. She was already operated uh, several times by the microscope, so the mastoid uh, cavity was already open. So we use a lot of curettes, chisel and the hammers, and then we were finding uh, the uh, uh, cholesteatoma, um, pressing the dura and going intracranial. So uh, in sometimes, so we open and then remove the cholesteatoma here uh, using uh, the endoscope to do this endoscopic procedure in a good way, in a good shape uh, to try to understand uh, the disease of the patient. And then at the end, we put some fat and then put some glue and close everything and the patient is nice. Uh, so this is the situation of Brazil right now. We are increasing the curve. Our curve, it's kind of similar to the Spanish uh, curve, but of course we are more, uh, we are behind Spain uh, and we had prepared our system to try to uh, understand and to try to hold uh, those kinds of disease. So this is a video which I find very nice, which shows the history of vaccination and the history of treatments throughout the history. So smallpox, you had like 2,000 years, almost uh, 3,000 years uh, to uh, develop a vaccination. Poliomyelitis also 3,348 years. Um, you had also uh, cholera, which you had like uh, 2,345 years to develop a vaccination. Um, uh, rubella or measles, you had like uh, 400, a thousand years to develop vaccination. Um, <coughs> rubella, which you had like 352 years. Uh, Ebola, five years. HIV, you had, and COVID, in four months, we are already doing trials on vaccination. So uh, science is going to get out us from this uh, pandemic. We should believe in science. Uh, we should respect science 
and we should do everything science uh, responds uh, uh, and have uh, the, the, the capability of show to us. So uh, we will win this pandemic, I'm sure. Uh, it's going to cost some lives, unfortunately, some human lives. But at the end, uh, I think as human beings, we will be stronger uh, than that. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I hope India also will have a very good situation like Brazil in the near future. And I hope to be back in India in the near future also uh, after this pandemic ends. And the message is, is protect yourself. You should protect yourself. This is the most important thing you should do, protect yourself. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joa. Hello? Yes. Uh, so I, I have a question. Wearing all these uh, PPEs, Sometimes in the operation theater, the uh, communication becomes a problem. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, when you're speaking, the sound may become muffled. As also, uh, you don't want to speak because there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, heat and uh, humidity inside the mask. So how do you tackle this problem of communication? Yes, this is a real problem. <coughs> I didn't tell, but also you put the mask and then we have to put a little bit of micropore here not to fog the goggles or not to fog the face shield. This is important. And what I do is I try to talk louder and more uh, uh, slow, slowly, uh, even for people to try to understand. Sometimes they don't understand. You have to speak again. But uh, this is a real uh, problem, the communication uh, in the OR. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Ritu? Yeah, there is one question uh, from the audience that what do we do in case there is a, a non-healing ulcer on the tongue? Do we go ahead with a biopsy when you're suspecting cancer or do we leave it or how do we go ahead with that? No, if you are suspecting cancer, as I told, this is a kind of a, a guideline, a general guideline, but you have to, to work case by case. If you are suspecting cancer and you think you cannot delay uh, this uh, diagnosis, you should do the procedure. To do tongue cancer, you can also do a tent uh, with like the microscope uh, uh, cover in the face of the patient, and then you create two holes to put your hands inside, and then you can work uh, with uh, outside the tent, but with the patient inside the tent, and then has uh, the less possibility of, of contamination um, in, 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 in the OR. Okay, thank you. Thank Dr. Joa, there is a question. Uh, should we do a preoperative COVID test every time we operate? Sometimes in emergencies, we may not have the time. Like there is a foreign body uh, bronchus or a foreign body uh, in the esophagus and we have to do it faster. So what do we do in such situations? Yeah, The ideal thing is to test everyone, even with the fast test in emergencies. But uh, we don't have this uh, in Brazil right now. So what we do is treat every patient as if the patient is COVID positive. So protect yourself, protect the patient, and do all the protective measures that you need to do if the patient has a COVID uh, positive test. So there is another question that, uh, how long does COVID-19 remain active in water? And if so, how, for how much time more? It depends on, on the water. Uh, I think it is if, aerosol. Uh, in aerosol. Sometimes they say that up to hours in aerosols. So if, if, if you have a lot of humidity in the air, sometimes you can have virus uh, in the aerosols. So this is very important also. To pro That's why it's important when you go out on the streets to try to use a face mask also to protect. It's not going to protect you 100%, but it's going to be uh, more protective. So to wash the hands is very important and to wash very, very many, many times the hands during the day, it's important also to use alcohol. It's, it's very important. Uh, I wanted to ask about sterilization of instruments, especially the scopes. So how do we sterilize the scope? Uh, because as uh, they are saying stainless steel, it can survive for a longer time. So do you have a way in which you sterilize the coronavirus? Yes, it's very important. The autoclavable ones can go to the autoclave and the autoclave will kill the, will inactivate the virus because of the heat. 
Uh, Stehad uh, sterilization also kills the virus because it has peroxide of hydrogen and, and kills the uh, kills, uh, destroys uh, the virus. So uh, it's important to use autoclave and also uh, Stehad if you have one of, you don't have to use both, but one of them you need to use. One question is, how, what about the OPD instruments? How do we sterilize the OPD instruments? Because they may not all go for autoclaving. Uh, the, the OPD with the Stehad. Yeah. If, if you cannot go to the autoclave, Stehad. Stehad is a good... Uh, if you don't have Stehad or autoclave, um, some uh, uh, substances will inactivate the virus. So you have to see what substances you have on, on your OR to, to clean those instruments and to see if those substances can inactivate the virus. Okay. So I don't there, have any further questions, Yogesh. Do you have any? There is a question about uh, in the OPD, what all procedures can we do? Can we do uh, ear suctioning? Uh, this is very important. I didn't tell, tell about this. When you do ear suctioning, you, you can do, but you, you have to use suctions without the ear, the hand device, the, the finger device. Okay. Or if you have the finger device, you close that finger device all the times. Because that can also uh, disseminate the virus when you are doing a uh, suction. So if you don't have, if you have a suction without the ear uh, device, the finger device, better. If you don't, you close all the time. 100% of the times, you close. You don't open. And about uh, tracheostomy, uh, so uh, how long should we wait uh, if the person is intubated and uh, it requires mechanical ventilation? and he has tested positive. Should we avoid a <coughs> to me? Yeah, this is a, a very um, tricky question because it will depend on the protocol of every hospital that you're working to. Some hospitals here are delaying the tracheostomy. People are getting intubated for like 20 days, 21 days without tracheostomy because they are afraid of doing the tracheostomy and, contam and contaminate the contamination that can be on, on the... So it's, it's kind of an ethical also question to the doctors because if you wait a lot, you know that pr sometimes you can have problems with the stenosis of larynx. But uh, some hospitals here, they wait 14 days. Some hospitals here, they wait 21 days to do the tracheostomy because of the, af the afraid uh, of, of contamination. Yeah, contamination. And also, when you do the, the, the tracheostomy, you, you have to do a tent. A tent also with a microscope cover, and then you work inside the tent. Your, your, your face is going to be out, you put two holes, and then you put the hands inside, and then you work inside the tent. It's difficult also because the, the microscope cover or the plastic is not 100% transparent, so it's difficult. That's why it's very important. When you do the procedure, it should be done by the most experienced surgeon in the service. No resident should be operated at this time, even if the resident has good rents, even if, if the resident has uh, uh, very good uh, ability, surgical ability, it's, di it's different. This is the area of uh, uh, the most experienced surgeons uh, uh, in the procedure. Yeah, uh, I think I have, that's the end of all questions. Ritu, you have any other questions? No, no other questions. <coughs> but I just want to say, to, to show something to, to Dr. Rito. Uh, this is my house, as you know. And sure. last time I was in Mumbai. Oh, yeah, we here. were going to ask you about uh, how's uh, JP, how's Bernard. Eh? Showing yeah. the Ganesha to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord Ganesha. Yeah. That was actually Yogesh's idea. Yeah. yeah. But let me see if I, if I can find the boys here. Lo Pedro. Presentation, Dr. Joa. Yeah, excellent presentation. We all I love that it. idea of the tent operating. Lo Pedro in the here? Yeah. Hi. I'll say hello to people in India. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. This is João Pedro. That's it. And here is uh, Mary. Mary's home room. I don't know. And uh, my wife is in her room. 
to go inside because probably she's not very well dressed. <laughs> Actually, in India, we are giving uh, hydrochloroquine prophylaxis to all ENT surgeons operating mm. and handling COVID-19 patients. So, in so right. <coughs> this is a very important information. In Brazil, uh, there were some doctors that uh, uh, um, they worked for this uh, prophylactic use of hydroxychloroquine, but it's not a, a, a I would say, a, a social, a, a social, uh, it's not a state policy. You can use if you want. Uh, this is Bernardo. Say hello. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> How are you? How are you? Bernardo is now two and a half. <laughs> How's your daughter? And uh, Ma Maria is about uh, th three months, okay. so she's good. She's good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All, all Thank the you. Uh, thanks. Be Take safe. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Protect yourself. This is the most important thing to protect ourselves. We are firefighters. We cannot go to a fire naked. We have to have protection. But the question is, how long can we delay elective work? You know, that is the means how long we are just the beginning of the pandemic now. Yes, I think uh, normal life is not going to be soon than uh, the, the end of the year because we have to to see even if the lockdown uh, ends, the virus will stay with us for a long time. Yes. So we don't have a treatment. Chloroquine is it's good, but it's not it's good for someone, but it's not the the, the treatment. No, um, we don't have a retrovirus. We don't have a vaccination. So we will have to understand and to try to, to create ways to work with the virus. Here in the Brazilian society, we are trying to create, uh, they are trying to create like a, a seal of quality uh, to, and, and market this to the patients uh, in the office. For instance, uh, many, many things that we can do in the office to like a, a space the chairs or space the times of the patients or try to put the patients with a suspected COVID in the beginning or at the end of the office uh, to try to generate the patients a fuel of security for the patients to come back. As I told you, 75% of the, of the patients, they, they are not visiting <coughs> the office anymore at this time, so the pandemic time. So um, we have to see what, what's going to happen. But uh, we have to wait because uh, I think it's going to be good. Yeah. So, all uh, AY office bearers are thanking you. Dr. Ajay, our secretary, also has said hi. Dr. Hi, Dr. Ajay, send me a, a message. Yeah. Bye, Joa. It was a nice presentation. I think you have to remove this beard. It's nice, yeah. but. I <laughs> It's a nice beard, but uh, protect yourself. Hazardous for health. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, we thank uh, Entod uh, Pharmaceuticals for uh, arranging this uh, web uh, webcast, and it uh, was being seen by a lot of people. And we thank the audience also for logging in and uh, attending this lecture. Thank you all. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank bye, you. Bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. So Raman, uh, we are done now. I think uh, we can. End.